Part One, Chapter One of The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One, by Edward Tyus Cook. Part One, Aspiration, 1820 to 1854. I go to prove my soul. I see my way as birds their trackless way. I shall arrive. What time, what circuit first, I ask not. But unless God send his hail or blinding fireballs, sleet or stifling snow, in some time, his good time, I shall arrive. He guides me and the bird. In his good time. Browning, Paracelsus Chapter One, Childhood and Education, eighteen twenty to eighteen thirty nine, Part One. One. I found her in her chamber reading, Phaedon Platonus in Greek, and that with as much pleasure as some gentlemen would read a merry tale in Boccace. Roger Ascham. To the tender sentiment and popular adoration that gathered around the subject of this memoir. Something, perhaps, was added by the beauty of a name which linked together the city of the flowers and the music of the birds. Her surname suggested to Longfellow the title of the poem which has carried home to the hearts of thousands in two continents the lesson of her life. The popularity of Florence, in the Middle Ages a masculine name, as a Christian name for English girls, is noted by the historian of that subject as due to association with the heroine of the Crimea. Both of her names were the result of circumstance. Her father came from the old Derbyshire family of Shore of Tapton, and changed his name in 1815 from William Edward Shore to William Edward Nightingale on succeeding to the property of his mother's uncle, Peter Nightingale of Lee, in the same county. Mr. William Nightingale was fond of travel, and the close of the French War, shortly before his marriage, 1818, had thrown the continent open to the Grand Tour. Mr. and Mrs. Nightingale's only children, two daughters, were born during a sojourn in Italy. The elder was born at Naples in 1819, and was named, firstly, Frances, after her mother, and secondly, after the old Greek settlement on the site of her birthplace, Parthenope. She afterwards became the second wife of Sir Harry Verney. The younger daughter, the subject of this memoir, was also named after her birthplace. She was born at Florence on May 12, 1820, in the Villa Columbiaia, near the Porta Romana, as a memorial tablet now affixed to the house records. And there, on the 4th of July, she was baptized by Dr. Trevor, prebendary of Chester. The place names became, in familiar intercourse, Partha, or Pop, and Flo. The surprises of sainthood, said a speaker at a congress on eugenics, are no less remarkable than those of genius. St. Francis of Assisi, St. Catherine of Siena and Florence Nightingale could no more have been predicted from their ancestry than Napoleon, Beethoven, Michelangelo, or Shakespeare. But the peculiarities of tissue on which some physical characteristics are held to depend can, at any rate, be inherited. Florence Nightingale's mother was one of the eleven children of William Smith of Parndon Hall, Essex, of whom Sir James Stephen said, when he had nearly completed fourscore years, he could still gratefully acknowledge that he had no remembrance of any bodily pain or illness, and that of the very numerous family of which he was the head, every member still lived to support and gladden his old age. This statement is not absolutely correct, for one child did not long survive its birth, but of the other sons and daughters of William Smith, none died at an earlier age than sixty-nine, two lived to be more than seventy-five, six to be more than eighty, and one to be more than ninety. This last was Frances, Mrs. Nightingale, who lived to be ninety-two. On the father's side there was longevity also. Mr. Nightingale himself lived to be eighty. His mother lived to be ninety-five. He had an aunt who lived to be ninety, and your uncle, wrote his father, young at eighty-two, enters into politics of the present moment with the ardor of twenty-two. Of the children of Mr. and Mrs. William Nightingale, Parthenope lived to be seventy-five, and Florence, 
though, or, in part, perhaps because, she lived for fifty-three years the life of an invalid, attained the age of ninety. Florence Nightingale, whether saint or not, was certainly conscious of a call, but there was nothing in her descent or inheritance which encouraged her parents to allow it to become readily effectual. Because she was a woman, her early life was one long struggle for liberation from circumstance and social prepossessions. Yet there were features in her mental equipment and intellectual outlook which may well have been inherited and which certainly owed much to environment. Sir James Stephen adds to the remarks quoted above that if William Smith had gone mourning all his days, he could scarcely have acquired a more tender pity for the miserable or have labored more habitually for their relief. In politics he was a follower of Fox. He was a friend of Wilberforce, with whom he cooperated in the House of Commons in the abolitionist and other humanitarian movements. Of Wilberforce, as of Thomas Clarkson, he possessed the almost brotherly love, and of all their fellow laborers there was none who was more devoted to their cause, or whom they more entirely trusted. In religion a Unitarian, he was a stout defender of liberty of thought and conscience, a persistent opponent of religious tests and disabilities. The liberal opinions, alike in church and state, which were thus traditional in the family of Florence Nightingale's mother, were shared by that of her father. Her grandfather Shore, in a letter to his son in 1818, referred to one of the finest pieces of eloquence, either in ancient or modern times, given by Sir Samuel Romilly in the Court of Chancery on a motion respecting the right of Jews to the benefit of a charity in Bedford. It does honor to the man and to human nature. Florence Nightingale's father was also a Unitarian, and in politics he was a Whig. How I hate Tories, he wrote to his wife, and in another letter after the election of 1835, in which the hated ones had gained ground, he explained that they were mighty only by beer, brandy, and money. The Whigs, as is well known, were not at all lacking in the latter equipment for political success, and Mr. Nightingale was a frequent subscriber to electoral funds on the Whig side. He was an ardent supporter of parliamentary reform. He held that Bentham has taught great moral truth more effectually than all the Christian divines. At a later time he was a follower of Lord Palmerston, of whom he was also a neighbor in the country. One of the earliest notices which I find of Florence Nightingale's interest in politics is in a letter from her father describing a meeting at Romsey to which he had taken her. Florence, he says, approved very much Palmerston's exposition of his foreign policy. Something else Florence Nightingale owed to, or shared with, her father. He, like some other members of his family, was of a reflective temperament, interested in speculative problems. There is a letter written by him to his wife from his father's sick room, September 1822, which shows the bent of his thoughts. I sit by his bedside and look at him as one would at a sleeping man, the idea of death only now and then flashing across my mind. I have been studying Madame de Stael on the feeling of conviction, which exists more or less in different people and different nations, on the subject of soul as independent of external ideas. My imagination is a dull one, for certainly it required study with me to feel the full force of conviction that soul does and must exist quite separately from, though influenced by, external circumstances. You will say, I know, with a firm belief in scripture and religion, leave all philosophical speculation to the wild imaginations of the Germans. Nothing can change your reliance on religion. The perversity of my nature refers me to experience and analogies, though I begin to think that the study of the creation displayed before our faculties will exalt me into a conception of divinity completely pervading the whole, but particularly that part of man which enables him to feel the difference between right and wrong independently of the ideas which he derives from external circumstances. Florence Nightingale's mother accepted the religious standpoint of the day without question. Unitarianism was dropped by her and by her elder daughter. By Florence it was, as we shall hear, transcended. The mother's essential bent was practical, though the scope of it was somewhat limited. The mind of her daughter Florence found room in equal measure for practice and for contemplation. She inherited her mother's organizing capacity, though she turned it to directions of her own. It was from her father that she inherited the taste for speculative inquiry, 
which absorbed a large part of her life. 2. From the worldly circumstances of her parents, Florence came to draw conclusions little sympathetic, in some respects, with existing usages and conventions. She accepted, indeed, the position of worldly wealth into which she was born without any fundamental questioning. In later years a young friend, on being urged to visit the villagers around one of Mrs. Nightingale's country homes, explained that she did not like the relation, she could not bring herself to go from a big comfortable house to instruct poor people on how to live. Miss Nightingale laughed and said, You surely don't call Lee Hurst a big house. It had only about fifteen bedrooms. She took for granted the position into which she was born, but she thought that wealth should only be used as a means of work. The easy, comfortable, not very strenuous conditions of her home life as a girl fixed the nature of her early years, but her soul did not become rooted in them. They sowed seeds which grew, as the years passed, not into acquiescence, but into revolt. Mr. Nightingale had inherited his great-uncle's property when nine years old. It accumulated for him, and a lead mine added greatly to its value. By the time of his marriage he was blessed, or as his younger daughter came to think, afflicted, by the possession of a considerable fortune. Whether it were indeed a blessing or an affliction, it involved him in much uncertainty of mind. He and his wife returned from the continent with their infant daughters in 1821, and the question became urgent, where to live? The landed property which he had inherited from his great uncle was a comparatively small estate at and around Lee Hill in Derbyshire. To this property he added largely. The hall, the old residence of his great uncle, was discarded. It is now used as a farmhouse, and Mr. Nightingale built a new house called Lee Hurst. The charm of its situation and prospect is described in a letter by Mrs. Gaskell. High as Lee Hurst is, one seems on a pinnacle with the clouds careening round one. Down below is a garden with stone terraces and flights of steps, the plains of these terraces being perfectly gorgeous with masses of hollyhocks, dahlias, nasturtiums, geraniums, etc. Then a sloping meadow losing itself into a steep wooded descent, such tints over the wood, to the river Derwent, the rocks on the other side of which form the first distance, and are of a red color streaked with misty purple. Beyond this, interlacing hills, forming three ranges of distance, the first, deep brown with decaying heather, the next, in some purple shadow, and the last, catching some pale watery sunlight. I am left alone, continued Mrs. Gaskell, established high up, in two rooms, opening one out of the other, the old nurseries. The inner one, in which Mrs. Gaskell slept, was, when Parthenope grew up, her bedroom. It is curious how simple it is. The old carpet doesn't cover the floor, no easy chair, no sofa, a little curtainless bed, a small glass. In the outer room, the former day nursery, Miss Florence's room, when she is at home, everything is equally simple. Now, of course, the bed is reconverted into a sofa, two small tables, a few bookshelves, a drab carpet only partially covering the clean boards, and stone-colored walls, as cold in coloring as need be, but with one low window on one side, trellised over with Virginian creeper as gorgeous as can be, and the opposite one, by which I am writing, looking over such a country. The sound of the Derwent was often in Florence's ears. When she was in the hospital at Scutari, any fretting in the straits recalled it to her. How I like, she said on a stormy night, to hear that ceaseless roar. It puts me in mind of the dear Derwent. How often I have listened to it from the nursery window. Lee Hurst became one of Florence Nightingale's earliest homes in England, but it was not the earliest of all. The house was not built when the family returned from the continent, and Mr. Nightingale took Kinsham Court at Pristine in Herefordshire. The place, it seems, was more picturesque than habitable and negotiations for the purchase of it, with a view to improvements, fell through. Mr. Nightingale liked Derbyshire, and was fond of his new house, but the rich, as well as the poor, have their perplexities. The difficulty is, wrote Mr. Nightingale to his wife, where is the country that is habitable for twelve successive months? And, again, how would you like Leicester? For my part, I think that, provided I could get about two thousand acres, and a house in some neighboring county where sporting and scenery were intolerable abundance, 
and the visit to Lee Hurst were annually confined to July, August, September, and October, then all would be well. While Mrs. Nightingale stayed at Kinsham, or took the children for a change of air to the seaside, or Tunbridge Wells, Mr. Nightingale divided his time between the management of his property in Derbyshire and the search for a second home elsewhere. Ultimately, he found what he wanted at Embley Park in the parish of Wellow, near Romsey. This estate was bought in 1825, and Kinsham was given up. Embley is on the edge of the new forest, and the rich growth of its woods and gardens is much favored by sun and moisture. Old oaks and beeches, thickets of flowering laurel and rhododendron, and a profusion of flowers and scents contrast with the bare, breezy hills of Derbyshire. Its new owners had here the variety they wished for, and a full scope for their taste. The most praised of its beauties is a long road almost shut in by masses of rhododendron. One of the occasional pleasures of Miss Nightingale's later life in London was a drive in the park, in rhododendron time, to remind her of Embley. 3. From her fifth year onwards, Florence Nightingale had, then, for her homes, Lee Hurst in the summer months, and Embley during the rest of the year. The family usually spent a portion of the season in London. The sisters led, it will be thus seen, a life mainly in the country, and Florence as a child became fond of flowers, birds, and beasts. A neatly printed manuscript book is preserved in which she made a catalogue of her collection of flowers, describing each with analytical accuracy and noting the particular spot at which it was picked. Her childish letters contain many references to animal companions. She made particular friends with the nuthatch. She had a pet pig, a pet donkey, a pet pony. She was fond of riding and fond of dogs. A small pet animal, she said many years afterwards, is often an excellent companion for the sick, for long chronic cases especially. The more I see of men, wrote a cynic, the more I love dogs. Florence Nightingale, in the same piece from which I have just quoted, drew a like moral from her experience of some nurses. An invalid, she said, in giving an account of his nursing by a nurse and a dog, infinitely preferred that of the dog. Above all, he said, it did not talk. There were no babies in the Nightingale family after the arrival of Florence herself, but most of her mother's many brothers and sisters married and had families, and as Mr. and Mrs. Nightingale's houses were often visited by these relations, there was seldom wanting a succession of babies, and in them, and their christenings, and teethings, and illnesses, and lessons, Florence took that interest which is often strong in little girls. Sometimes a baby died, and her letters showed that Florence was as much interested in a death as in a birth. She rejoiced in The Little Angels in Heaven. One of her favorite poems at this period was The Better Land, of Mrs. Hemans, which she copied out for a cousin as so very beautiful. The earliest letter which I have seen, written when she was ten, strikes mingled notes. She is staying with Uncle Octavius Smith at Thames Bank, a house which then adjoined his distillery at Millbank, and writes to her sister, who is on a visit with the maid to another set of cousins. Give my love to Clemence, and tell her, if you please, that I am not in the room where she established me, but in a very small one, instead of the beautiful view of the Thames, a most dismal one of the black distillery, and whenever I open my window, the nasty smell rushes in like a torrent. But I like it pretty well notwithstanding. There is a hole through the wall close to my door, which communicates with the bathroom, which is the next room where Freddy sleeps, and he talks to me by there. Tell her also, if you please, that I have washed myself all over and feet in warm water since I came every night, I went up to the distillery to the very tip-top by ladders with Uncle Ock and Fred Saturday night. We walked along a great pipe. We have had a good deal of boating, which I like very much. We see three steamboats pass by every day, the Diana, the Fly, and the Endeavor. My love to all of them except Miss W. Give my love particularly to Hilary. Your effect and only sister. Dear Pop, I think of you. Let us love one another more than we have done. Mama wishes it particularly. It is the will of God, and it will comfort us in our trials through life. Goodbye. Was Miss W. an unsympathetic governess? Whoever she was, the exception in her disfavor shows an unregenerate impulse which contrasts naively with the following good resolve towards her sister. 
To a year earlier belongs a little notebook entitled Journey of Flow, Embley. It begins with the reminder, The Lord is with thee wherever thou art, and then an entry records, Sunday, I obliged to sit still by Miss Christie till I had the spirit of obedience. As a child, and throughout all the earlier part of her life, Florence was much given to dreaming, and in some introspective speculations written in 1851, she recalled the pleasures of naughtiness. When I was a child and was naughty, it always put an end to my dreaming for the time. I never could tell why. Was it because naughtiness was a more interesting state than the little motives which make man's peaceful, civilized state and occupied imagination for the time? To Miss Christie, her first governess, Florence became greatly attached, and the death of the lady a few years later threw her into deep grief. She was a sensitive and somewhat morbid child, and though she presently developed a lively sense of humor, to which she had the capacity of giving trenchant expression, it was the humor of intellect rather than the outcome of a joyous disposition. Her early letters contain little note of childish fun. They are for the most part grave and introspective. She was self-absorbed and had the shyness which attends upon that habit. My greatest ambition, she wrote in some private reminiscences of her early life, was not to be remarked. I was always in mortal fear of doing something unlike other people, and I said, if I were sure that nobody would remark me, I should be quite happy. I had a morbid terror of not using my knives and forks like other people when I should come out. I was afraid of speaking to children because I was sure I should not please them. Meanwhile, she was perhaps at times, even as a child, a little difficult at home. Ask Flo, wrote her father to his wife in 1832, if she has lost her intellect. If not, why does she grumble at troubles which she cannot remedy by grumbling? End of chapter 1, part 1Part 1, Chapter 1, Continued, of The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 1, by Edward Tyez Cook. Part 1, Chapter 1, Childhood and Education, Continued. 4. The appeal to his daughter's intellect was characteristic of Mr. Nightingale. He was himself a well-informed man, educated at Edinburgh and Trinity, Cambridge, and, like some others of the Unitarian circle, he held views much in advance of the average opinion of his time about the intellectual education of women. The home education of his daughters was largely supervised by himself. It included a range of subjects far outside the curriculum current in young ladies' seminaries, and perhaps, like Hannah More's father, he was sometimes frightened at his own success. Letters and notebooks show, it is true, that his daughters were duly instructed in the accomplishments deemed appropriate to young ladies. We hear of them learning to use the globes, writing books of elegant extracts, working footstools, and doing fancy work. They studied music, grammar, composition, modern languages. We used to read Tasso and Aristo, and Alfieri with my father, Florence said. He was a good and always interested Italian scholar, never pedantic, never a tiresome grammarian, but he spoke Italian like an Italian, and I took care of the verbs. Mr. Nightingale added constitutional history, Latin, Greek, and mathematics. By the time Florence was sixteen, he was reading Homer with his daughters. Miss Nightingale used to say that at Greek her sister was the quicker scholar, their father set them appointed tasks to prepare. Parthenope would trust largely to improvisation or lucky shots. Florence was more laborious, and sometimes would get up at four in the morning to prepare the lesson. Her knowledge of Latin was of some practical use in later years. In conversations with abbots and monks whom she met during her travels, she sometimes found in Latin their only common tongue. Among Florence's papers were preserved many sheets in her father's handwriting, containing the heads of admirable outlines of the political history of England and of some foreign states. Her own notebooks show that in her teens she had mastered the elements of Latin and Greek. She analyzed Tusculan disputations. She translated portions of the Phaedo, the Crito, and the Apology, 
She had studied Roman, Greek, Italian, and Turkish history. She had analyzed Dugald Stewart's philosophy of the human mind. Her father was in the habit, too, of suggesting themes on which his daughters were to write compositions. It was the system of the college essay. Florence has now taken to mathematics, wrote her sister in 1840, and, like everything she undertakes, she is deep in them and working very hard. The direction in which Florence Nightingale was to exercise the faculties thus trained was as yet hidden in the future, but to her father's guidance she was indebted for the mental grasp and power of intellectual concentration which were to distinguish her work in life. It is a natural temptation of biographers to give formal unity to their subject by representing the child as in all things the father of the man. To date the vocation of their hero or heroine very early in life, to magnify some childish incident as prophetic of what is to come thereafter. Material is available for such treatment in the case of Florence Nightingale. It has been recorded that she used to nurse and bandage the dolls which her elder sister damaged. Every book about the heroine of the Crimea contains, too, a tale of first aid to the wounded, which Florence administered to Cap, the shepherd's collie, whom she found with a broken leg on the downs near Embley. I wonder, wrote her old pastor to her in 1858, whether you remember how, twenty-two years ago, you and I together averted the intended hanging of poor old Shepherd Smithers' dog, Cap. How many times I have told this story since. I well recount the pleasure which the saving of the life of a poor dog then gave to your young mind. I was delighted to witness it. It was, to me, not indeed an omen of what you were about to do and be, for of that I never dreamed, but it was an index of that kind and benevolent disposition, of that First Corinthians chapter 13 charity, which has been at the root of it. And it is certainly interesting and curious, if nothing more, that the very earliest piece in the handwriting of Florence Nightingale, which has been preserved, should be a medical prescription. It is contained in a tiny book, about the size of a postage stamp, which the little girl stitched together, and in which the instruction is written, in very childish letters, sixteen grains for an old woman, eleven for a young woman, and seven for a child. But these things are, after all, but trifles. Florence Nightingale is not the only girl who has been fond of nursing sick dolls or mending them when broken. Other children have tended wounded animals and had their pill boxes and simples. Much, too, has been written about Florence's kindness as a child to her poor neighbors. Her mother, both at Lee Hurst and Embley, sometimes occupied herself in good works. She and her husband were particularly interested in a cheap school, which they supported at their Derbyshire home. Large sums of money have been paid, wrote Mr. Nightingale to his wife in 1832, to your schoolmistress for many praiseworthy purposes, who works con amore in looking after the whole population, young and old. Florence took her place beside her mother in visiting poor neighbors, in arranging school treats, in giving village entertainments. But thousands of other squires' daughters, before and after her, have done the like. And Florence herself, as many entries in her diaries show, was not conscious of doing much, but reproachful of herself for doing little. The constant burden of her self-examination, both at this time and for many years to come, was that she was forever dreaming and never doing. She was dreaming because for a long time she did not clearly feel or see what her work in life was to be, and then for yet another period of time because, when she knew what she was called to do, she could not compass the means to do it. Her faculties were not brought outwards, but were left, by the conditions of her life, to devour themselves inwardly. The discovery of her true vocation belongs, then, to a later period of our story, and it was not the result of childish fancy or the accomplishment of early incident, it was the fruit of long and earnest study. What did come to Florence Nightingale early in life, perhaps, as one entry in her autobiographical notes suggests, as early as her sixth year, was the sense of a call, of some appointed mission in life, or self-dedication to the service of God. I remember her, wrote Fanny Allen in 1857 to her niece, Elizabeth Wedgwood, as a little girl of three or four, then the girl of sixteen of high promise. When I look back on every time I saw her after her sixteenth year, I see that she was ripening constantly for her work, and that her mind was dwelling on the painful differences of man and man in this life, and on the traps that a luxurious life laid for the affluent. 
a conversation on this subject between the father and daughter made me laugh at the time the contrast was so striking but now as i remember it it was the divine spirit breathing in her in an autobiographical fragment written in 1867, Florence mentions as one of the crises of her inner life that God called her to his service on February 7, 1837, at Embley, and there are later notes which still fix that day as the dawn of her true life. But as yet she knew not whither the spirit was to lead. For three months, indeed, as she notes in another passage of retrospect, she worked very hard among the poor people under a strong feeling of religion. 5. Presently, however, a new direction was given to her thoughts and interests. She was now seventeen, her sister eighteen. Their home education had been far advanced, and might seem to require only such finishing as masters and society in France and Italy could supply. Mr. Nightingale had, moreover, decided to carry out extensive alterations to Embley. With his wife and daughters, he crossed from Southampton to Arve on September 8, 1837, and they did not return to England until April 6, 1839. Those were days of leisurely travel, such as Ruskin describes, in which distance could not be vanquished without toil, but in which that toil was rewarded, partly by the power of deliberate survey of the countries through which the journey lay, and partly by the happiness of the evening hours, when from the top of the last hill he had surmounted, the traveller beheld the quiet village where he was to rest, scattered among the meadows beside its valley stream, or, from the long-hoped-for turn in the dusty perspective of the causeway, saw, for the first time, the towers of some famed city, faint as the rays of sunset, hours of peaceful and thoughtful pleasure, for which the rush of the arrival in the railway station is, perhaps not always, or to all men, an equivalent. There were many such hours during the journeys which the Nightingales took with a Virturino through France and Italy, and Florence, writing at a later date, when all her life was fixed on doing, noted that on this tour there was too much time for dreaming. Yet it is clear from her diaries that she entered heartily and with a wider range of interest than some English travelers show, into the life of foreign society and sightseeing. A love of statistical method which became one of her most marked characteristics may already be seen in an itinerary which she compiled, noting in its several columns the number of leagues from place to place, with the day and hour both of arrival and of departure. They went leisurely through France, visiting, besides many other places, Chartres, Blois, Tours, Nantes, Verdot, Biarritz, Carcassonne, Nîmes, Avignon, and Toulon, and then going by the Riviera to Nice. There they stayed for nearly a month, December 1837 to January 1838. A month was next spent at Genoa, and two months were given to Florence. The late spring and summer were devoted to travel in the cities of northern Italy, among the lakes, and in Switzerland. They spent the month of September in Geneva, and reached Paris on October 8, 1838. Miss Nightingale preserved her diary of the greater part of the tour, and it shows her keenly interested alike in scenery and in works of art. It contains also what records of sentimental pilgrimages often lack, an admixture of notes and statistics upon the laws, the land systems, the social conditions, and benevolent institutions of the several states or cantons. Her interest in the politics of the day was keen wherever she went, and the society of many refugees into which she was thrown at Geneva gave her a particularly ardent sympathy with the cause of Italian freedom. The diary contains many biographical notes upon Italian patriots, whose adventures she heard related by their own lips. A stirring day, she wrote on September 12, 1838, the most stirring which we have ever lived. It was the day on which news reached Geneva that the Emperor of Austria had declared an amnesty in Italy. The Nightingales attended an evening party at which the Italian refugees assembled, and the imperial decree was read out amidst loud jubilation, which, however, was afterwards abated when it turned out that the general amnesty contained many conditions and some exceptions. The Nightingales had the entree to all the learned society of Geneva. Florence records an evening spent with Monsieur de Candolle, the famous botanist, and the diary gives many glimpses of Sismondi, the historian who was then living in his native city. He escorted the Nightingale party up the Salève 
they made that not very formidable ascent first on donkeys and then in a sledge covered with straw and drawn by four oxen florence was present on another occasion when all the company gathered round sismondi who sitting on a table gave us a lecture on florentine history the conscientious florence made a full note in her diary of the great man's discourse all sismondi's political economy she also noted seemed to be founded on the overflowing kindness of his heart he gives to old beggars on principle to young from habit at pescia he had three hundred beggars at his door on one morning he feeds the mice in his room while he is writing his histories presently there was a new excitement in geneva what a stirring time we live in florence wrote on september eighteenth one day to decide the fate of the italians tomorrow to decide the fate of switzerland tomorrow was the day fixed for the meeting of the council representatif which was to take into consideration the demand of louis philippe for the expulsion of louis napoleon the future emperor many pages of miss nightingale's diary are given up to this affair she analyzed all the pros and cons and recorded day by day the course of the debate sismondi thought that the refugee ought to be surrendered on principle because he was a pretender in expediency because geneva would be unable to withstand a french assault he spoke for an hour in this sense the genevois radicals on the other hand while entertaining no great love for the pretender thought that cost what it might the sacred right of asylum should be maintained and so the debate continued the french government began to move troops from lyon the genevois to throw up fortifications whereupon mr nightingale like many other english visitors thought it time to take his family across the frontier miss nightingale's diary written en route to paris shows her excitement to obtain news of the crisis when she learnt that it had been solved by louis napoleon being given a passport for england she did not see that louis philippe had gained very much the pretender would be nearer and not less dangerous in london than in geneva a very just prediction not every girl of eighteen when taking her first tour abroad shows so lively an interest in political affairs politics and social observations mingle in the diary with artistic and architectural notes the city which seems to have most appealed to her imagination was not florence though she said that she would not have missed it for anything and curiously her sojourn in her birthplace was the occasion of a characteristic incident an english lady who afterwards became princess Rus kostritz was staying in the same lodgings and fell ill and florence nightingale volunteered to nurse her but the city which she most admired was genoa la superba she notes indeed the excessive indolence of the nobles and excessive poverty of the people but the palaces realized an arabian night's story for her mr and mrs nightingale had many friends and brought many introductions in the various towns where they stayed they mixed in the best society and their daughters were thrown into a lively round of picnics concerts soirees dancing balls and masks begun at midnight burning ever to midday when they made up fresh adventures for the morrow there were court balls at which grand dukes were exceedingly polite to florence nightingale and her sister they went to an evening court at florence and found every one most courteous and agreeable there was a ball at the casino in genoa at which writes florence in her diary my partner and i made an embrulment and a military officer came up with a very angry face to challenge me for having refused him and then not dancing but the music was not all to the tune of a toccata of galuppi's what gave florence the greatest pleasure on this tour was the italian opera in those days the reigning singers were grisi la blanche rubini and tamburini florence nightingale heard them all her Italian diary is nowhere so elaborate as in descriptions of the operas and in notes on the performers. She kept a separate book in which she wrote tabulated details of all the performances. I should like to go every night, she said in her diary, and for some time after her return from the continent she was, as she wrote to Miss Clark, music mad. She took music lessons at Florence and in London studied under German and Italian masters. She played and sang, it was as yet uncertain whether the call, to what as yet also unknown, might not be drowned in the tastes, interests, and pursuits which fill the life of other young ladies in her position. 6. The fascination of social life must have been brought vividly before her during the winter, 1838-39, to 39, 
which they spent in Paris, in apartments in the Place Vendôme, number 22. She was now introduced into the brilliant circle of the last of the salons. Mary Clark, afterwards Madame Mole, was by descent half Irish, half Scottish, by education and residence almost wholly French. A charming mixture, said Ampère of her, of French vivacity and English originality. Full at once of esprit and of espiegalerie, well-read and artistic, yet wholly devoid of pedantry, without regular beauty of feature, but alert and piquant, Mary Clark had gathered round her what Tickner, in 1837, had found the most intellectual circle in Paris. For seven years she and her mother lived in apartments in the Abbe Abu, adjoining those of Madame Reclamier, and Mary was a daily visitor to the famous Salon, during the reign of Chateaubriand, whose closing years she did much to brighten and amuse. At the time when the Nightingales arrived in Paris, Mrs. and Miss Clark had left the Abbe Abu and established themselves in those apartments in the Rue de Bach, which for nearly forty years were a haunt of all that was brilliant in the intellectual life of Paris. Mary Clark took most affectionately to the Nightingale family, who, with some of their connections, remained for long years among her closest friends. She used to pay a yearly visit to Mr. and Mrs. Nightingale, either at Embley or at Lee Hurst, generally staying three weeks or a month, and to her many of Florence's most interesting letters were, as we shall find, addressed. To her other and more superficial qualities, Mary Clark added great warmth of lasting affection for her intimate friends, and her sympathetic kindness to the Nightingale Circle was unfailing. The attraction of Paris to Florence lay principally in its hospitals and nursing sisterhoods, but partly also in that it was the home of Clarky, as they called her. And it was the same with other members of the family. There is a letter from Lady Verney to Clarke which describes how some one asked Mr. Nightingale, Are you going to Paris? Oh, no, he replied. Madame Mole is ill. Then does Paris mean Madame Mole? Yes, certainly, he replied gravely. During the winter of 1838 to 39, Miss Clark, writes Lady Verney, was exceedingly kind to Florence and me, two young girls full of all kinds of interests, which she took the greatest pains to help. She made us acquainted with all her friends, many and notable, among them Madame Recamier. I now know, better than then, what her influence must have been thus to introduce an English family, two of them girls who, if French, would not have appeared in society, into that jealously guarded sanctuary, the most exclusive aristocratic and literary salon in Paris. We were asked, even, to the reading by Chateaubriand at the Abbe Abou of his Memoirs d'Autre Tombe, which he could not wait to put forth, as he had intended when writing them until after his death, desiring, it was said, to discount the praises which he expected but hardly received. This hearing was a favor eagerly sought for by the cream of the cream of Paris society at that time. In Miss Clark's own apartments, the Nightingales met many distinguished men. The intimates who were always there, and who assisted their hostess in making the tea, were Messieurs Ferial and Mole. Claude Ferial, versed in medieval and provincial lore, a man exceedingly handsome, who had captivated Madame de Stael and other ladies besides Mary Clark in his friendships, and Julius Mole, one of the first Orientalists in Europe, a more ardent lover whom, after a probation of eighteen years, Miss Clark married in 1847. Monsieur Mole was once asked by Queen Victoria why, loving Germany so much, he had given up his native country for France. Ma foi, madame, he replied. J'ai tort amoureux. With Monsieur Mole, no less than with his wife, Florence Nightingale was on terms of affectionate friendship. Among the frequent visitors whom she and her sister met at Miss Clark's were Madame Tastou, the poetess, Elie de Beaumont, the geologist, Roulin, the traveller and naturalist, Cousin, Minier, Guzot, Tocqueville, Barthélemy, Saint-Hilaire, and Thiers. The last named was one of Miss Clark's earliest admirers, and many years later, after the Franco-German War, when Thiers was at the head of affairs, Lady Verney heard Monsieur Mole say to his wife, Madame, why did you not marry Monsieur Thiers instead of me, for now you would have been Queen of France? In such circles as that which gathered around Miss Clark, Florence Nightingale was well qualified to hold her own, and even to play a brilliant part. 
Her life of gaiety on the Riviera and in Italy must have rubbed away much of the shyness from which she had suffered. If not beautiful, she was elegant and distinguished. She was both widely and deeply read. She had many and varied interests. She had powers of expression in which clearness was not unmixed with a note of humorous subacidity. These are social advantages, and she was not without the inclination to use them. She chose in the end another path, a path which was beset by many obstacles of circumstance. But there were obstacles in herself also, and one of the last temptations to be overcome, before she was free to interpret her call and act upon it, was, as she wrote in many a page of confession and self-examination, the desire to shine in society. End of chapter 1